all the way from the UK, Keith Coates, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real privilege for me to be here. Um, I am based in the UK now, but I hail from South Africa, and I can't think of a better place to be on a golf course in blue skies as a South African. So thank you very much for that. And while I get pleasantries out the way, uh, good luck for the European Championships. Okay, my hopes are with you. We haven't got much time, and we're going to look at what it takes to be a future fit leader. Essentially, as a futurist, that's what we do. I was asked the other day when I was going through immigration at Heathrow, uh, when the uh, immigration officer got to occupation, uh, it stopped him dead in his tracks when he saw the word futurist. His brow puzzled up a bit. He looked at me and said, so can you tell me who's going to win the premiership this year? I said, I'm a futurist, not a fortune teller. And what futurists do is we help you anticipate and build scenarios as to the likely challenges that you're going to face. One of the most important things about understanding any discussion on leadership is that it is always, always context specific. What that means is you can't just take a blueprint of leadership and think that because it was originated in North America, it will apply in China or Africa or Europe. Leadership is always context-specific, and that both comp makes the conversation complex and very nuanced. And so uh, my job today is to paint a bit of a backdrop as to the global context in which you need to think about your own leadership practice. We were involved in a global research a few years ago out of the East-West Centre in Hawaii that looked at the impact of globalisation. And the research that lasted several years came out with four interesting taglines, if you like, around the global context for leadership. One, increasing interdependence. We know that. If Asia sneezes, Africa catches a cold. You are leading in a context where economies are intertwined like never before. Secondly, um, an understanding that change is not linear. And we'll talk a bit more about this later. Thirdly, increasing complexity. And that is why yesterday's leadership solutions don't work today. Not because they were bad or didn't work, they did work very well, but you cannot take yesterday's thinking around leadership and apply it today. Drucker suggests that the turbulence is not the challenge for you as a leader, it's the use of yesterday's logic in the turbulence. And certainly our message to business leaders is that turbulence is the new operating norm. You had better get used to flying through turbulence. I think clear air flying is going to be remarkably few and far between. The fourth one took the researchers by surprise, and that was an increasing emphasis on difference. And we could spend a whole day on this, because what I think the next big leadership agenda is going to be is a deeper understanding and conversation around what it means to lead and manage difference. This whole global diversity, be it age, be it culture, uh, a whole range of diversity. And the leadership conversation globally hasn't really matured on this factor. But as a leader going forward, you are going to be required to lead through increasingly diversity and difference and build a framework as to what that means. So Peter was right. Change is the ubiquitous condi con uh, prevailing condition in which you are finding yourself. Unrelenting change, and it's not going to change any time soon. When futurists talk about the future, we talk about the way it unfolds in three different scenarios, if you like. The first way is continuations. What that means is tomorrow will look very much like today. And so by understanding and analyzing today, we get a heads up into what tomorrow will look like. Cycles, as the name implies, economic, political, and social cycles. What goes around, comes around. Novelty in the futurist language is the thing that is unexpected. The curveball, the 9-11, the thing that very few people could foresee but proved to be a game changer. Now, five years ago, futurists believed based on the best algorithms and uh, modeling that futurists can come up with, that the future would happen in that kind of percentage. In other words, the majority of our tomorrows is going to be shaped by what is happening today, just a linear progression, if you like, into the future. But you'll notice that was five years ago. Current thinking amongst futurists has done that to the table. Now, 
you could argue that those percentages aren't fully accurate. They're the best estimates that futurists can come up with. But you can see the trend difference. And one of the casualties of that is strategic planning. You simply cannot plan your way into that level of uncertainty. And one of the downsides that we as Tomorrow Today saw as you walk, work across the globe and across industries is that following the economic downturn and crash of late 2008, senior leaders held on to strategic plans that had been fashioned prior to the rules of the game changing as they did in that moment. And all they did was they tweaked the bottom line on the balance sheet and made adjustments around cost saving, etc. If ever there was a situation in global history where strategic plans should have been shredded, a blank piece of paper pulled out and the question asked, now what? That was the moment. And generally, we saw a collective inability or failure at a leadership level to do that. And we started to ask why. And I think it's because we've become so reliant on strategic plans. They give us a sense of security. Leaders have forever been told, if you're a leader, then you need to do Porter's model of strategic planning. But I'm not saying you don't plan at all, but I'm saying hold lightly to your plans in a world of that level of uncertainty. A lot of this work comes from Jim Data. I know Jim, he's a retired futurist in Hawaii, and I get to chat to him as I work there every year, which is not a bad place to work if you're going to work. And uh, Jim is an eccentric, wonderful character. He's given his name to what is known as Data's Second Law of Futures. Data's Second Law of Futures states the following. Any useful idea about the future needs to appear ridiculous. Any useful idea about the future needs to appear ridiculous. So here's a great question for you as a leader. If you were to look at your EXCO agenda right now, is there a ridiculous idea on that agenda? Data does add an important rider to that, and that is this. Not every ridiculous idea is useful. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So disruption is perhaps a better word than change to describe our future. We've been disrupted at every level. Again, this forms the backdrop of another entire keynote and framework that we've got as tomorrow today. But let me give you a quick heads up as to some of the main motivators or disruptors that you know full well. One, the incredible level of personalization of service and product, the empowered customer. It's happening in all different areas. One of the most successful adverts or campaigns ever embarked upon. Secondly, algorithms, AR, automation. We know that this is a massive disruptor in many sectors, especially the financial sector. I was at a banking conference last week in Switzerland where we presented a white paper on the future of banking and financial services. And certainly robotic intelligence is playing havoc with uh, certain forms of advisement when it comes to investing and banking. Uh, earlier this year, the Go World Champion was beaten by artificial intelligence in a game far more complex than chess, a game that nobody ever thought that anyone other than a human could win. And in game two of a five-match series, the robot made a move, it was known as Move 37, that was unparalleled. It gave people an indication that perhaps we saw for the first time ever robotic intelligence, a robot thinking, not just responding out of a whole data bank on possible moves, but a robot learning and actually initiating a move that was unprecedented. You can look it up and do some more investigation for yourself. But a significant point in the process of artificial intelligence, learning to think for itself and demonstrating that. Another major disruption is on tap economy. You probably have people working in your offices that are uh, selling their services outside of your particular setup. And I'm sure other speakers will allude to this later. The upwork economy, if you like. So if you go to Fiverr, you can get any thing animated or uh, access to people who can do this. We asked, uh, we went on to Fiverr and we asked them to animate our logo and within one day this is what we got back and it cost the pricely sum of five dollars. Think about the disruption that that means to people in marketing houses for whom this is their job. When I can go online, contract anybody anywhere around the world and it costs me five dollars and I get an instant response to something I ask them to do the upmarket workplace. We think in tomorrow today that this will perhaps be one of the biggest game changers. 3D printing years ago when we talked about it was on the fringe. It's now become a major disruption. 
Virtual reality is much the same. The impact of virtual reality will be huge. And so when you understand virtual reality, and I brought one with me, the Google Cardboard Box, $5. And if I had more time, I'd get one of you up, I'd put my cell phone in, and I'd give you an experiential understanding of what it means. All you do is you put your cell phone in here, you close it, and you get to enter a totally different world. Now this is $5. Obviously the experience will be limited. But when you think about what you can do with this, with proper headphones and an Oculus or another headset, it's going to transform what we understand by experience. The Marriott Group recently in New York City uh, put up two virtual reality booths outside the courthouse. And people coming out, having just signed their marriage certificate, they offered them a honeymoon anywhere in the world. And you could enter this booth, if you like, a virtual reality booth, and go on honeymoon as a couple to Hawaii. Um, the impact of this, I think, is going to be big. And then lastly, um, platform players. The ability of people who are on a platform to influence the entire industry. And this is where fintech is playing out, and uh, the banking world is understanding it very, very sharply. Why? Because these people aren't just changing the rules, they're changing the entire game. And as Facebook takes out a banking license in Ireland, which it already has, watch what that will do to the banking industry, given Facebook's ability to personalize their service and product. So all of that by way of disruptions to say this, how come then, when we know this to be the fact that this is, tends to be what we respond in leadership, in our thinking about organizations, uh, and there's a problem. When it comes to the future, what we cannot afford to be doing is what happens here. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do. So. One's got to keep moving. How many of you have heard of the Monty Hall problem? Few, okay, so you'll know where I'm going with this. The Monty Hall problem was written up in a wonderful book called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. And uh, it's currently a West End production in London. I read the book because I have a colleague who has an autistic teenager. And the book is a book written through the eyes of an autistic kid. And I thought it might help my understanding of what he and his wife are going through. Um, anyway, they've turned this into a wonderful production, Should You Be in London, highly recommended. And in the book, they talk about a real case that happened in real life. And the case is that a woman by the name of Marilyn Fonsant, and I'm going back to the late 80s, was according to the Guinness Book of Records, the cleverest person in the world. She had the highest recorded ID, um, IQ rather. And what Marilyn Fonsant did is she wrote a syndicated paper column called Ask Marilyn, where people would write in with riddles and problems, and she'd respond. And she also had a couple of radio programs, Ask Marilyn. And one day a caller phoned in with what has become known as the Monty Hall problem, which is this. Imagine you're in a game show, and I'm the host and you the audience, and I say to you, the audience, there are three doors. Behind two of the doors are small goats, and one door has a Ferrari. Now, let me just be absolutely certain. I think I'm on safe ground here. The Ferrari's the win, right? We understand. I have worked in parts of the world where the goats would be far more valuable, but just to clarify that. So I say to you, right, two of those doors have goats. One has a Ferrari, and I say, you, sir, please choose a door. So let's just say that was your right. Okay, it's my right, okay? Sometimes I get right and people say, wow, he really is a mind reader. So let's just say you chose that door and then I as the game show host come to you and I open up door two and I reveal a goat. I then say to you before revealing whether you've won or not, do you want to switch or do you want to change? Quickly turn to the person next to you, 30 seconds, do you switch or change? 
in order to win the Ferrari. All right, how many say you switch? Minority. So the majority, I'm assuming, stay, say you stay. And the logic in staying or switching often is built on this. It now is a 50-50. There are two doors, and I'd be gutted if I had chosen the Ferrari and I switched, is often the underpinning logic. So I'm going to stick. But it doesn't really matter because it's a 50-50. In response to whether you stick or switch, Marilyn Fonson said back to the caller, you switch every time to increase your odds of success. She was berated by professors of mathematics in the United States who wrote into her telling her she was corrupting young American minds because her, her maths was faulty. Until she came out with an uh, equation that proved categorically that by switching you increase your odds of success. Because the mistake we make in the Monty Hall problem is this. We treat it as a two-door problem once one of the doors has been opened. But it doesn't ever become a two-door problem. It remains a three-door problem. Now, when I do sometimes workshops around this, we actually get to experiment, and I'll show you categorically, because I know some of you are looking at me and you clearly don't believe me. But here's the lesson from the Monty Hall problem. Changing doesn't, does not guarantee you success, but I can tell you this, that if you guard the status quo and you don't change, it lessens your chances of success. I'm often asked by CEOs, well, Keith, if we do this, this, and that, will we be guaranteed success in the future? And I say, well, again, how do I know? There are too many, oh, I don't know. But I can tell you as a leader, if you are not changing, you are going backwards. You are not even standing still, you are going backwards. And that's an important principle from the Monty Hall problem. So we've got to then ask, what does this mean for you as a leader? How do you lead in this changing world? And I want to suggest that you are leading in a world that looks pretty much like that ship deck on an, a cruise liner off the New Zealand coast. And I'm very glad I wasn't on that cruise liner. Because that is the reality of the world in which you're trying to lead. Stability is something that is not going to happen easily. And what we've got to ask ourselves is, are there pillars that we can hang on to in a world that is increasingly looking like that, and that becomes the norm for what is going on? And you'll see there VUCA. VUCA is an acronym that futurists use to describe the prevailing conditions in which you are leading. You're leading in a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that's a nice uh, handle to put on the global context in which you find yourself leading. And so if those are the prevailing conditions and the context, we've got to have new conversations around what it means to lead in that context. And so I'm going to suggest that we can mirror that acronym and apply it to four things that you as a leader will need to consider and four conversations that will help you in a VUCA world. We'll talk a bit about vision. We'll talk about understanding connection, and lastly, about adapting or agility. So let's quickly look at what I mean by vision. By vision, I'm not talking about being able to see far into the future or think like a futurist, which is important leadership work. I'm talking more about how it is you see, the lenses through which you view the world. So as an example, I have four lenses that dramatically impact how I see the world, and I can't change any one of these four lenses. I have more than four lenses, but here are four of my lenses. I'm a white, male, South African, baby boomer. And if I don't think that my white, male, South African baby boomer doesn't get in the way or impact how I interpret the world around me, it would be naive at best. And so the real work that leaders need to do is a deeper understanding of the biases and prejudices or the lens through which you view the world. Another way of understanding it would be to understand our seeing. So let me do an experiment. Let me ask this half of the room, and I'm at risk here of you nodding off, to close your eyes. Can I ask you to close your eyes and keep them tight shut? Okay, so this half over here that have got your eyes open, okay, I want you to look at that picture and quickly get your answer, okay? You've got your answer, there's no trick in that. It's a very simple equation. Now what I'm going to ask you to do who are looking at the screen is to close your eyes. So can you close your eyes? Okay. Now this group over here, I feel like a hypnotist. This group over here that's had your eyes closed, can you open your eyes? Okay. And I'm going to show you a picture and I want you to come up with the answer, okay? How many ends? Simple equation, okay? 
Right, everyone open your eyes. Open your eyes. <laughs> no, you're kidding. All right, call out your answer. Four, three, 12, 16. You saw the same picture. And some people yet see 16 and 12 and 3 and 4. And it's just a very simple illustration that we can look at the same scenario, but our lenses interpret how we see the world around us. And if you're not cognizant of that as a leader, then you are open to misinterpretation almost every step. And this plays directly into the diversity agenda that I referred to earlier. So again, it is a complex situation in which you are leading. Another way to illustrate this kind of how we see things would be to take two women, one in Stockholm and one in Beijing. Each woman is 50 years old. If you go back 30 years and you look at Stockholm 30 years ago, that would be a picture from Stockholm 30 years ago. Beijing 30 years ago looked like that. If you fast forward and you look at Stockholm today, it looks like that. Maybe one building has changed color but it's pretty much a carbon copy of Stockholm 30 years ago. However, Beijing looks like that. Now, here's my question. In a world of exponential change, which woman do you think understands global change better? And this becomes a challenge for Europe. I live in a country, or lived until recently in a country, that was an emerging economy. If you want excitement, you go to Africa. If you want excitement, you go to Asia. And so depending on which part of the world you come from, you might have a total different take on globalization and exponential change. And this becomes a challenge for a part of the world that is changing slower than others. And again, it goes around mind shifts that are needed at a leadership level. When I talk about understanding, understanding means the ability to recognize that we are living increasingly in a time of ambiguity and paradox. Paradox can be described as the clash of two rights. So let me give you an illustration, a story, if you like, that illustrates this very powerfully. I have a black South African friend, and it's important that you understand he's black. He's a Zulu gentleman for the purpose of the story. It's his story, and it happened to him back in the late 80s in South Africa, a very different political and social setting in the country back then. His name is Spiri, and one day what happened was he had gone to have his lunch hour. He had come back to go back to his office that was in a high-rise building, and he was standing at the basement level with a throng of people waiting for the elevator doors to open. And as the doors opened, because he was near the front, he walked in first. And as he walked in first, he felt a hand grab him by the collar, and he turned around in his words to see the largest white guy he had ever seen, who said, hey, wear your manners. Don't you know women go first? Spivy said to me, Keith, in my culture, the Zulu culture, men go first. He said, I've come to understand that in your culture, women go first. And the polite thing for me to have done according to your sense of right in that scenario would have been to step aside and let the ladies go in first. But he said, I wasn't thinking. I just did what was right by my culture. That is what we call a cultural paradox, a right versus a right. I was doing some work at the United Nations in Bangkok a few years ago and quite interestingly talked to a global demographer who told me this, that according to how the United Nations measure diversity, Southeast Asia is the most diverse region on the planet. South Africa is the most diverse country. He told me that the average South African deals with diversity seven times more than his peer or her peer counterpart globally. That's incredible. Because my conversation then with Spivy said, well, how do you manage this cultural paradox? I look you in the eye to show you respect. I don't look you in the eye to show you respect. I stand in your presence to show you respect. I immediately lower myself in your presence to show respect. How do you deal with cultural paradox? How do you deal with generational paradox? I'm sure we all hear just now that a lot of the stuff playing out in the workplace right now is paradoxical in nature. Generations have a different understanding of life-work balance, paradoxical levels of understanding around what is respect. My generation, positional respect. Title's important. A younger generation, Positional respect means nothing. It's relational respect. You've got to earn my respect. It's a paradox around how respect is built. We have structural paradox, centralized versus decentralized. Now, here's the challenge. If you don't understand it as paradoxical, you're going to argue out of your sense of right. And I turned to Spiri and I said, so how do we resolve this? And he gave a great answer. 
He said the person with the understanding can choose a response that doesn't escalate the conflict. I want to respectfully suggest as leaders, you are dealing increasingly with a world of paradox. And if you don't have frameworks of understanding to help you interpret what's happening in that paradoxical moment, then the conversation just goes nowhere. So we need to understand what it means to unlearn. Alvin Toffler said that uh, the literature of the 21st century, you can read it for yourself. But I love that saying, and it dates all the way back to 72 in his classic book called Future Shock. And so a real leadership agenda is not only one around learning, but it's around what is it you maybe need to unlearn, let go of, and relearn. Hoffer, who is a philosopher, again, emphasizes this importance of learning for leadership. Now, I say it's important because when we get to adaptive leadership just now, you'll see that learning is fundamental to surviving in the future. And yet when I step into executive teams, I often don't come across an executive team that is really fixated around learning. They are more intent around operational issues in their business. And of course that's important. And of course you've got to focus on that. But when as a leader did you last learn? When, as a leader, did you deliberately put yourself in a place of learning? Now, you would argue, and I guess I'm speaking to the converted, because you wouldn't be at a conference like this if you weren't interested in learning. But think broader than yourself. And I often work with executives who really, for the most part, have stopped learning and are relying on experience, and we'll see how dangerous that is just now. When you go to biology and you look at biological systems that evolve, what happens to the DNA is one of three things or a combination. The DNA, in order to adapt to the future or the new scenario, decides what to keep that is useful in spite of the disruption that's happening. It also then decides what to discard and it decides what needs to be created or in biological terms rearranged. There are three great strategic questions for you. What is it in your business right now facing the disruptions and the turmoil that you are facing increasingly do you need to keep? Very often I see businesses guarding the wrong things. Who are the guardians? What are they guarding? Who are the paradigm shifters and what are they saying? What is it you need to discard? And that's maybe a more emotional discussion and harder discussion to have. And what is it you need to create and how do you go about that? But that is, comes from evolutionary biology and I think it's very instructional for organizations today. Mark Twain was a user of tremendous profanity. He blamed the fact that as a young man, he used to hang out with steamship captains for the fact that his language was very colorful. And a story I love telling, it's a true story, is that his wife spent a lifetime trying to reform him from using bad language. It never succeeded. And one day in desperation, she decided that she was going to throw back at Samuel Clemens, his real name, her husband. She was going to throw back at him every single swear word she could ever remember him using. And coming from her, that would shock him into some kind of reformed reality. So she didn't have to wait very long. The story plays out. They were in their house one day. He was in a different room. Something happened and he went off pop and he was using all this foul language. She marched into the room and let him have it. She stood in front of him and delivered this barrage of filth. At him. I'm sure he was shocked. But the story is he stood there very still. And eventually, as you would expect, she ran out of words. At which point he leaned forward and he said, my dear, you have the words, but not the tune. And I think today leaders need to hear the tune. You know the words. You know the words. But it's hearing that tune that is running deeper. And how do you get to hear that tune? So the second understanding that we need in this world of paradox is a, a, a huge understanding around the importance of questions. The ability to ask good questions, the quality of your questions is going to determine the quality of the answers or the solutions that you find. Hello, I'd like to order french fries, a burger and a milkshake. This is a library. And 
you say, oh, Keith, I've got one of those in my team. But it's not just about asking questions. It's obviously asking the right questions. This is Kirstenbaum's work, and I love it because he talks about the DNA of a company. And DNA always has four elements to it. And so whether you're a company of 50 people or 50,000 people, you would have these four things present. And I make a very important point here around the importance of organizational culture in order to be future fit. You see, most people leaders understand their role when it comes to strategy. And strategy drives how we move our service or product. It could be a very formalized strategy or a very loose and formal strategy, but there's always a strategy, a strategic component to our business. And for decades, leaders have been taught that is your primary work, the formation and execution of strategy. And that's why when in your leadership pathway, you've learned about Porter and other models of doing strategy. The problem with Porter's model is this. By the time you collate around the six factors and the six facets of Porter's model and do all the research and analytics, and then you assemble it to make coherency for your business, your industry, your context, then you fashion a keynote address that you as the leader often has to go out and tell to the troops, and then you eventually get to roll out your strategy. By the time you get here, the distance from there to here, too much time has gone by. And the goalposts have moved, but now you committed to a strategy because you've invested all this time and energy and money into it, and so we've got to play it out. Now again, I'm not saying strategy is not important, but I'm saying if you want to be future fit, it's never a matter of strategy, it's more of a cultural issue. They've done research around why big mergers in particular have failed. Some of the biggest transatlantic mergers have failed at a corporate level. And these were smart strategies put together by clever leaders, and yet they failed. In fact, research shows that only between 10 and 30% of strategic initiative succeeds. That is an incredibly poor return on something that takes so much time and investment. And when they look at why it's failed, it's never because it's bad strategy or poor leadership. It's failed because the organizational culture can't support it. So the conclusion from this that we can draw is this, that as a leader, your real work is not strategy or strategic formation and execution, as important as that is. Your real work as a leader is to pay attention to organizational culture. And if you forget everything else I said, and you probably would, here's what I want you to remember in order to be future fit, which I'm often asked, how do we ensure that we are future fit personally and organizationally? My answer is this, it's never a matter of strategy. It's a matter of culture. If you've got a culture that is agile and nimble and adaptive and quick, you will survive. And I know too many companies that are relying on a clever strategy to keep them future fit. And the problem with that is that strategy will always be behind the pace of global change and disruption. So if you said to me, well, Keith, just quickly give me a heads up as to what is culture, because that's a big subject. I know of companies that are actually employing cultural anthropologists to deepen their understanding around organizational culture. It's made up of four things. If I was called into your company and you said, do a cultural audit, here's where I'd start. I'd look at four particular areas of your business. How do you make decisions? How do you deal with information? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? How does it get disseminated? That would tell me an awful lot about your culture. What structure do you have? And then what are your motivators? How do you incentivize behavior? Now again, what we're going to hear this afternoon, as you look at a younger generation and motivators, my generation was motivated by things like title, position, career advancement, you knowing that you as the business will look after my personal development. But you've got a younger generation coming in today who are motivated by three things, freedom, fun, and flexibility. Freedom, fun, flexibility. If I went to my father, were he still alive, and said, Dad, I'm going to work and I want to have fun, I know exactly what his answer would have been. He would have looked at me over his glasses and said, my boy, why do you think we call it work? There was no expectation in his generation to go to work and have fun. But today, it's an integral part. I want to know I'm contributing to something bigger than who I am. I want to make a difference. And if leaders aren't aware of the generational shift and the generational agenda around values and behaviors that result, again, a lot of effort can be wasted. I was talking to the director in Stockholm of the Kairos Institution, because in, as tomorrow today, we do a lot of work in generational theory. He told me a fact that was startling. Here was what he told me based on their research, that 72% of graduates by the age of 30 are no longer working in the field in which they qualified. That is why retention is the challenge it is. 
You see, in my generation, if you qualify an accountant, you die an accountant. If you qualify a lawyer, you die a lawyer. You stay on that trajectory. I might change companies once or twice, but I don't change trajectories. You've got young people today who are qualifying accountants and by 27 are working in tourism or showing people around Bali or surfing in Bondi Beach, Australia. Total shifts. And again, we don't have time to go into the generational mindset around that, but that is why retention is the number one corporate strategic challenge right now. And my fear is we don't understand the nature of the problem and our responses are all inadequate and are completely wrong. I'll come back to that just now. Very briefly under connection. We need to rethink connection because connection is changing through social media and social technology. And I think you'll agree with me that all of these words that are coming up now are important in your business. What they mean in your business is critical, not just in your business, but also how you connect to your clients and customers. Those are important words. Now, here's my point about those words. Social media has changed the definition of every one of those words. And some of those changes are paradoxical in nature. And again, I hear many companies and leaders getting caught up around my definition of what it means to connect or my definition of what it means to interact, as opposed to an understanding that there's a paradoxical understanding of different generations as to what those words mean. And if I don't frame that paradox, I can't have a meaningful conversation within each one of those areas that are vital to the lifeblood of every organization. That top picture was taken in St. Peter's Square at the inauguration of Pope Benedict in 2005. That bottom picture taken in St. Peter's Square from the same place at the inauguration of Pope Francis, the current Pope. Look at how the world has changed. And I still meet leaders today who think that in this world that exists like it shows there in 2013, they can control the conversation. And my message to leaders who think they are in control of the conversation is, you're not. At best, you can influence it. And if you're not in the conversation, then how can you influence it? And I know many leaders of my generation who take great pride in the fact that they stand outside of the conversation and they don't educate themselves around social media, etc. And I think that's a huge oversight. Is it difficult? You bet it's difficult. Does it mean unlearning? Absolutely. But if you're not in the conversation, you simply cannot influence it. And you certainly cannot control it as a leader in that reality. Let's start wrapping up around probably the most important of all the points, around the ability to be adaptive. I'm often asked by leaders, in my opinion, they will say, what does it take for me as a leader or us as an organization to be successful in the future? And certainly my answer can be debated, but the immediate response I give without hesitation is around adaptability. If you are not adaptable or agile, I simply do not know how you will survive this future, this VUCA world future that we've been talking about. It's fundamental. And one of the key things around the model of adaptive leadership is a distinguishing between what is known as a technical problem and an adaptive problem. A technical challenge and an adaptive challenge. An adaptive challenge is basically described as knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And I want to suggest you are facing as leaders more and more adaptive challenges. A technical challenge, you know exactly what the problem is. So let's just quickly draw up this matrix to help clarify the difference. In a technical problem, the problem is clear. I have a headache, I go to the doctor, after some tests she diagnoses me as having a brain tumour. I know what the problem is. Technical problems can be very serious and very complex. But in a technical problem, the definition of the problem is clear, as is the solution. My surgeon says to me, Keith, I can go and I can operate, it's benign, and the chances of survival are good. And the locus of control or work is the surgeon who says, with my team, I can get this solved. You face a lot of technical problems. You know what the problem is. There is a solution, and it means you telling somebody what to do in order to get that fixed. Experience and technical problems is invaluable. Because the solution you've got to a technical problem probably comes from looking at the shelf of your leadership pathway and seeing 